Today, I want to talk to you about this subject. We're going to finish our series out of Psalm 23. This is the fourth message. If you haven't listened to the messages before, you need to go listen to them. I think they'll be a real help to you. But today's the last one. And here's the topic I'm going to talk to you about today. The God who chases you. The God who chases you. Now, before you get all wondering what this means, I was raised, uh, I became a Christian when I was eight years old. My dad had gotten saved. Uh, we started going to church. I got baptized at eight. And by the time I was 10 years old, the church that we were in, I'd already begun to develop this idea about who God was. And maybe you were like this as well. I began to get the picture in my mind of a God that's the giant guy in the sky with a stick ready to whack you upside the head. Anybody ever get that picture of God growing up or at some point in your life? Now, if you come here, you know that I am intensely committed to the word of God. And I believe that God's word is infallible. However, I don't believe that humans are infallible. And sometimes, even with good intentions, we hear preaching that maybe not, might not be accurate. And so my whole theological underpinning growing up was that God was chasing me, but it wasn't because he loved me. It was because he wanted to whack me up the side of the head for all the mistakes that I'd made, all the things that I'd done wrong. And if I did something wrong, God was going to be really, really, really upset with me. And I can remember my mother kind of instilling this in me as a young boy. And I'll never forget this. We would have prayer as a family. And my mother literally prayed these words. Oh, God, if Richie ever drinks, break his leg. And I'm like, what? Thank God, because I would have had a broke leg today, all right? That's all I'm saying, all right? Thank God that God didn't answer that prayer. She prayed this prayer. God, if he ever smokes, break his arm. And I'm like, wow, God sure is into breaking bones, all right? So, but that was my theological underpinning uh, growing up. The problem is, even though I had a wonderful experience in the church that I grew up in, and they really loved the Lord, and they believed the Bible, their interpretation was not infallible, and they weren't necessarily intensely committed like we are to teaching the truth to the best of our ability. But I am committed to that. And here's what I know. God chases you, but not for the reason you may think. When I was about four years old, my dad was mowing the grass one day, and I loved to go outside and watch him do it and play while he was mowing the grass. He had a big riding mower. My dad, who was filled with love for me, sold that riding mower when I got old enough to mow the grass and bought a push mower. And I had to mow about two acres, pushing it out. Thank you, Dad, for your love, all right? But I'll never forget this particular day, my dad's mowing the grass. You know, he's making the laps around the house and around the yard. And I began to watch him and he would look at me and wink and laugh and we'd have fun. And I remember him coming around and I decided, I'm playing with my dad, I was gonna start running from him. Now you have to understand where we lived. We lived on a, on a road that was, our house was not too far from the road. But right across that road was my grandmother's house. And often we would cross the road. I mean, it was literally just across the road, not very far walk. We would go across to see my grandmother. I loved going to my grandmother's house. But I was never allowed to do it by myself because it was a very busy road and it could be very dangerous, especially for a young boy. And I remember I just turned around. I started running from my dad. And when my dad saw me, he began to yell, and I couldn't really hear him because the lawnmower was going. And I'll never forget that my dad jumped off the mower. He didn't even stop the mower. He jumped off the mower and began to chase me. I'm four years old. I'm thinking, either my dad is playing, he's mad at me for something, or he's lost his mind. And so either way, I'm going to Granny's house 
And I'm looking over my shoulder, running as fast as I could go. And my dad yelling at me, looking worried, looking scared. And he's yelling at me, and I couldn't hear him. I couldn't understand him. And I'm running for all I'm worth. And my dad is chasing me. What I did not realize is where we lived, right on a curve, there was a car that was coming at full speed. And as a four-year-old boy, I was running right in front of this car. If someone did not intervene, if something did not happen, that car would have killed me, would have run me over, purely an accident, but I was running to my death. I was running to my demise. I was running to my ruin. And my dad, thank God for him, he put his own life on the line. And at the last minute, he's out in the middle of this road and he scooped me up into his arms and took me to the other side as that car sped by where we were. And I've thought about that a lot. My dad was not chasing me because he was mad. My dad was not chasing me because of something that I had done wrong. My dad was not chasing me to punish me. You know my dad, you know why my dad chased me? Because he loved me. He was chasing me to save me. He was chasing me because of his great love for me. All I can say about this message that I'm going to give you today from the last verse of Psalm 23 is this, is that God pursues you. And he does not pursue you because of what you've done wrong. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. Why? Because he's the God who chases us. If you are a Christian today and maybe you have wandered from him, he is chasing you down, not to hit you with a stick, not to punish you, but he is chasing you because he loves you. And if you are his, according to the scripture we're gonna read today, he will chase you all of your life. Now we've read in Psalm 23, the entire Psalm, but before we read this last verse, I want to define a word for you. Now, for those of you that are familiar with church, you know that the Bible has an Old Testament and a New Testament. The Old Testament was before Jesus. The New Testament was written after Jesus. And the Old Testament was written originally in Hebrew, a little bit of Aramaic, but mostly Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. There is a Hebrew word for the word we're going to see, the word follow. But I want to define it before we read it so you can understand it. Uh, the word follow in Hebrew here means to pursue or to chase down. To pursue or to chase down. So let's read this word in Psalm 23, verse number six. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. There's that word. It means to pursue, to chase you down. Surely, goodness and mercy is gonna chase me. It's gonna pursue me. It's gonna follow me. How long? All the days of my life. Surely, that word surely, it can be translated from the Hebrew language in a word that even makes this more special. That word can be translated only, only, not surely. Surely means that it, you're confident of it. Surely means that you are sure of it. Surely means that without question, you know it's going to happen. You have total faith in it, total confidence in it. Surely, but that word can say it this way, only goodness and mercy. Only goodness and and mercy. Now, how can a person come to that conclusion? Is that a person that's living with their head in the clouds? They're, they're just not living with reality because we all know that there are more things than goodness and mercy that chase us down. 
I mean, the truth is, even in this very psalm, it says that we go through the valley of the shadow of death. But you've got to understand what's being said here in this verse and in this psalm. And I want to kind of just kind of rephrase it for you. The first part of this psalm shows us how to begin a relationship with God. And the last part of it shows us what's going to happen in eternity. And the verses in between, they show us how to live our life as we're getting ready for eternity. You say, what do you mean by that? The Lord is my shepherd. It's a very personal thing. And until you have a personal relationship with God, none of this really applies to you. You see, your parents could have been a Christian. Your grandmother may have been very faithful to the Methodist church. In fact, she was so faithful, she bought a pew and had one of those brass plaques on the end of it. So you knew that was her spot. And if you ever sat in her spot, you got in trouble, right? Some of you have been around, you know what it's like. But it doesn't matter what your grandma was like. Oh, I'm glad that your grandma was a Christian. I'm glad that she was faithful to church. But your grandmother, your mother could have been as faithful uh, as there ever was, a person that ever was, and it doesn't really matter to you in your relationship with God. The Lord is my shepherd. David writes that it's a personal relationship with God. And that's how it begins. But interestingly, the verses up to verse six show us what happens when we become followers of Jesus Christ. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. You see, God says when you begin to trust him in a personal way, what happens? Well, something amazing happens. God gives you the peace of God in your life. Does it mean that you never have problems? Well, of course not. Does it mean that uh, you always have perfect peace when you lay your head on the pillow at night? Well, that's where the work is in progress because the fact is when you get peace with God, in other words, when he becomes your shepherd, that's when you can begin to grow in the peace of God. And suddenly those things that were traumatic in your life, those things that were struggles in your life, those things that caused turmoil and chaos in your life, you know that God begins to lead you into still waters and green pastures and he will restore your soul. And then it begins to go a step further. God begins to show us how that when we come into this relationship with him, when we begin to have peace with God, that even in our troubles, he's with us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Does God say that you're not ever going to have trouble? No, that's not what he says. The fact is, he knows that we're gonna, because of this humanity, because of this sinful nature that we have, because of uh, this world, there are going to be problems. There are going to be valleys. There are going to be temptations. There are going to be trials. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, shadow can't hurt you. I will fear no evil because you are with me. God shows us that this trial, this, this, these problems that we go through, that they are temporary because when we get to eternity, it's going to be amazing. But here's the key. God is with you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. This is the progress in the Christian life. And then, and I love this. He said, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God fights for you. He, he will defeat the enemy. He is the one. And then the scene changes. In the first part, we have the loving shepherd. In the second part, we have the conquering king. This pictures God's grace. This pictures salvation because what happens is you must understand that you are not the shepherd and you are not the king. You are not the protector. You are not the conqueror, but God is. And it's faith. When I begin to put my faith in him, what happens? He says, you begin to prepare before me a table in the presence of mine enemies uh, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. 
You see, the more you begin to grow in this Christian life, the more that you get closer to God, the clearer picture you get of who God is. He is the loving shepherd. He is the conquering king. You understand more about his grace, that it's not you, but it's him. It's not your effort, but it's his. God's not against effort. He's only against thinking that your self-effort is all that's necessary for you to have the wonderful relationship with the shepherd or to conquer your enemies. Not so. God's grace, the conquering king, he prepares before us a table. He's the one that wins the battle. In the presence of mine enemies, God is the one that defeats your enemies. It is through his grace that we live. And then he begins to prepare you for service. He said, you anoint my head with oil. You know, and I mentioned the Hebrew language, that word really could be and is in some places translated not just oil, but the oil of gladness. Amazing. You see, in case you're wondering, you don't have a relationship with God, there is nothing like it. Oh, Christians aren't perfect. We know that. Uh, Christians, they still get things wrong, and sometimes they have bad days, and sometimes they still sin. Sometimes they don't act like Christians. We get that. But I can promise you this. There is nothing. There is nothing that brings greater joy. There is nothing that brings greater peace. There is nothing that brings greater purpose to life than a relationship with God. And he begins to anoint you with the oil of gladness. You're glad. Things that made you sad before, not that they're good things. We still face bad things, but God is with you and you can have joy and peace in the middle of your valley. You anoint me. That is a picture of God preparing you to serve. And the fact is, you faced enemies. And if you had to face them alone, you would be defeated by those enemies. But the conquering king is the one that prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies, almost as if God taunts those enemies. Oh, yeah, you used to do this. Oh, yeah, you remember what she was like back then? Oh, yeah, you remember what he did then? Let me show you. I am preparing a table in your presence so you can see it, that you are conquered and you no longer have power over my child. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And then I love this, my cup overflows. Are you living out of the undertow? A lot of people do. They get sucked under by life. They get sucked under by the media, social media, politics, what's going on in the world. And boy, that can be defeating. Don't live out of the undertow, but live out of the overflow with the oil of gladness. Oh, I love this. And then he brings us to this last thought. This last thought. Um, He said, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So you see, he's saying what happens is you get saved. You get the peace of God. uh, Then you begin to get peace with God and God begins to restore your soul. And yes, you go through problems, but God is the one that that protects you. God is the one that defeats your enemies. God prepares the table before you. He anoints you with oil of gladness. You begin to live out of the overflow. And then suddenly, and you don't know what day it comes. You don't know what sermon it is that caused you to believe it. You don't know what time that you are reading or praying that you begin to truly believe it with all of your heart. But suddenly your mind is changed, your outlook has changed, your perspective is changed in life, and you no longer believe that it's just the bad things that follow you in life. Let, let me give you a warning. As a believer, you have no right to say, only bad things follow me. Trouble follows me wherever I go. Chaos is in my wake. Always. You may be talking about your organizational skills, and I don't think this is really talking about your organizational skills. But in life, Scripture says, only goodness and mercy chase you down and pursue you. How long? For all of your life. 
all of your life. Well, you don't understand, I've failed in the past. Only goodness and mercy, the conquering king. Only goodness and mercy. It's not trouble that follows you. It's not chaos that follows you. Are there troubles in life? Yes. Is there chaos in life? Of course. But the the mind shift must happen in the mind of a believer that you begin to see the reality. Because here's, here's what I want you to understand, and this is a truth that you can put down. Faith trumps reality. Write that down. Believe that. Those of you that are online, you like electronics, tweet it out. I don't care. Faith trumps reality. You say, well, my life seems like it's filled with chaos. And and it seems like problems follow me everywhere I go. God says, only, not just surely, only goodness and mercy are going to follow you. They're going to pursue you. See, here's the point. Uh, the, The trouble can be left behind. The trouble can be overcome. The conquering king can overcome that. The trouble, you don't have to keep it next to you all of your life. But God says, goodness, because of my love, because of my spirit, goodness and my mercy, my grace, my never ending love, my mercy that's renewed every day. That is what's gonna follow you every day of your life. Let, let me, I wanna give you three points. Now, If you believe in miracles, I'll be done here in about 13 minutes, all right? There are three things that I want you to see in this passage that I believe show us how God pursues us. Remember, he's the God who chases us. Only goodness and mercy are gonna pursue you, chase you down. I mean, isn't that incredible? The fact is that we live in this chaotic world and God says, hold on. I'm chasing you down with goodness and mercy. That just is overwhelming to me. And there are three things that God uses. It's three words. I just want to give you three words. The first word is communion. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. There is a sweet communion that comes from being in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And by the way, this implies change in our life. Only goodness and mercy. That's what he's saying. There is, when you get saved, there is a change. We call this sanctification. We call it spiritual growth. We call it becoming more like Jesus, but that begins to happen in your life. That's why we say we wanna bring people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. The more you grow, the more you understand the word of God, the more you understand faith, the more you understand God's grace, the more you're able to see that and recognize that, and you're no longer gonna live in the negative and think that only bad things follow you, that chaos is your plot in life. It's your lot in life, but God says, no, something must change. There must be a mind change. Don't say failure follows you because God says only goodness and mercy follow you. Revelation 21, 5, Jesus says, behold, I make all things new. He wants to make you new. It implies change, but it also instills confidence. This communion with God begins to instill confidence in our life. He says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. You know, there are a lot of Christians that don't have confidence. The fact is because I think it's one of the number one struggles that some people have in their life is the assurance of their salvation. They think things like this. Well, if I was a Christian, I wouldn't have thought that thought. If I was really a Christian, how could I possibly even said that? If I was really a Christian, would I have done that to my wife? Would I have said that to my husband? If I was really a Christian, would I have looked at that? And even things that you have struggled with, that you said, God, forgive me, Lord, I don't want to do it again, and I I promise I'm not going to do it again. I am determined I'm never going to do it again, and before the week is out, you do it again. That can cause doubt if you don't understand what salvation really is. It is not up to your works. Now, is God against morals? No. Is God against you keeping the Ten Commandments? No, not at all. 
but he is against you thinking that that's what's gonna save you. And see, if it's grace and it's free, then there are no conditions to it. It will change you, but understand that change is what propels us to do good works. Change is what causes us, the change that God brings, the newness that he brings, this new spirit is what causes us to behave. That's not what earns your salvation. Does that make sense? In other words, you don't do it to get saved. You do it because you are saved. And so it instills confidence about your salvation. 1 John 5, 13 says, I write these things to you who believe the Lord's my shepherd, belief. In the name of the Son of God, that's salvation, Jesus, that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know. That you may know. 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 For those of you that really struggle, you can have confidence that because of Jesus, because of the shepherd, And because of the conquering king, you can know. Oh, I blew it this week, but you know what? Thank God for his grace. I still know that I'm a Christian. Oh, man, I shouldn't have said that. I lost my temper. Uh, Man, I I had a horrible thought toward this person. I thought, boy, God, I wish you would do this and this and this to her. And boy, I I mean, there's no way that a Christian should think that. But thank God that I know because of Jesus that I'm saved. This communion with him, it implies change, it instills confidence, and it inspires courage. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. You see, you can be confident of your salvation, and that's one level, but if you wanna go to another level entirely, you need to be confident in your salvation. You say, what's the difference between those two things? Well, knowing that you are saved is one thing, but knowing that God is at work in your life is another thing altogether. Communion. Why does he pursue us? Why does he chase us down? Because he wants to fellowship with us. He loves us. He wants to have communion with you. And here's the second word. It's the word completion. This phrase, and I love it, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. How long? All the days of my life. You know what that implies? that God is not gonna leave you undone. He's not gonna leave you half-baked. He's not gonna leave you half-finished. But rather, he is gonna finish what he started in you. Now, I realize that sometimes we don't participate too well. And sometimes we screw up. Eventually, God's gonna complete what he started in you. It may be in heaven. In fact, I know it will be in heaven. The fact is, if you think you're gonna be perfect on this earth, I've got bad news. You won't. You never will be, no matter how hard you try. It doesn't give us an excuse, but rather it shows us that God is not only pursuing us, he's preparing us. He pursues you with his love, but he's preparing you for something greater. Not just on this earth. He is preparing you for something greater. Something that God wants you to do. I I look at that even in my own life. I realize I'm a pastor. But you know, I'm constantly looking, asking God, what else do you want me to do? What next step do you want me to take? And I'm open to that. I believe God has given me this assignment for life. I believe that, and I've shared that with you many times, uh, that I believe that God called me here, and I'm confident of that. As long as you'll have me, I wanna be the pastor of this church up until I have only one or two marbles rolling around. And uh, when that happens, I'll retire and that, I don't know when that'll be, okay? Some people think that's sooner than later because I don't know that I have all my whole bag of marbles up there. But here's what I know. God's preparing me. Listen to Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, he who has begun a good work in you, that's Jesus, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's the day he comes back. You know what that means? And this should excite you. God's not finished with you yet. Oh, you may have blown it recently, but God is not finished with you yet. You may not be all you ought to be, but God is growing you. You you may not be all that you ought to be, but thank God you're not what you used to be, and you're not yet what you're going to be one day, because God is growing you. He still wants to use you. He has given you a commission. He is the God who chases you down. 
Thank God. Now I'll say this. Uh, those of you that know me and been here for a while, you know that uh, you know a year and a half ago or so, I, I had some real physical problems, and thank God I'm almost completely better. Uh, there was a while that I was in bed for like two months, couldn't get out, then went to a wheelchair, couldn't walk. Um, and uh, during that time, I lost about 70 pounds in a couple months. And I'm here to report to you today, unfortunately, I've gained all of it back, all right? <laughs> I weigh exactly what I weighed before I got sick. And uh, now, the truth is, before I got sick, uh, we got a lot of runners in here. I ran a lot, okay? Um, I ran six full marathons, 26.2 miles. I ran two ultra marathons, 54 miles. And I ran about two or three half marathons. You say, what are you saying? I was a big old fat dude that could run. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) One year, I ran the Albany Marathon here in Georgia. And during that run, I missed a turn. Somebody was supposed to be there to direct you. We ran through part of a neighborhood, and I missed the turn. And I started running down the wrong street. And when you're running 26.2 miles, you don't want to run an extra step, much less an extra mile. And thank God there was a guy in that race that chased me down. He chased me down and said, you're going the wrong way. Now, did that guy punish me? Nope. Did that guy beat me up? Nope. You know why he chased me down? Because he wanted me to get on the right path. And you know why God chases you down? He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to be on the right path. And... (laughs) This was what happened as I, I, he got me back on the right path. And as I crossed the finish line, I'll never forget this. There was an announcer up in a booth, not far from the finish line. And he says, ladies and gentlemen, here comes Richard Miller completing the race. And man, we, everybody was excited. They clapped and it was so encouraging. And then he said something that made me very upset. He said, Mr. Miller is in our Clydesdale division. Now, if I had not just run 26.2 miles, I would have gone and punched him, okay? But I didn't have the energy to walk the extra 20 yards uh, to get to that. I was tired. And here's my point. I want you to miss this. I probably didn't look pretty. He probably thought that I didn't look like what a runner should look like. I weighed about 225 pounds, and I had just run 26.2 miles. He knew that I wasn't the fastest because I wasn't anywhere close to being the first one that crossed the finish line. But you know what? In spite of what he thought about me, in spite of what I looked like, in spite of what everybody may have thought about me, and I want you to miss this, I finished my race. I crossed the finish line for my race. And I want to tell you what Jesus says to us here, this idea that surely goodness and mercy are going to follow me all the days of my life, and I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He is going to complete what he started in you. And you may not look like what everybody thinks a Christian ought to look like. You may not even act like all the time what people think you should act like. But I want you to know God is going to chase you down, not to hit you upside the head, but to get you to cross the finish line, to get you to finish your race because it is your race. God wants you to finish it well, to finish it well. And then here's the last word, the word celebration. This is a peek into eternity. He says, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. (laughs) All this goodness in life, In heaven too? Are you kidding me? Jesus said in John 14, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. In some translations, it reads many mansions. That's probably a bad translation because all in in that culture, in that day, when you got married, you would go to the Father's house. It's a very patriarchal society. 
And so often the father would add on a room to make room for you and your new wife. And the, the picture was, and it was a completely different kind of culture that we have today. So it's not that they were just dependent on them. It's not that, uh, that they, they were just glad to be a part of the family. And so Jesus is using this language and he says, I'm going to go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'm going to come again and bring you to myself that where I am, there you may be also in the house of the Lord forever forever in the presence of God. Luke 15, 24, for this son of mine, this is from the prodigal son, for this son of mine was dead and is now returned to life. He was lost, but now is found. I want you to get this idea of celebration. And so the party began. That's that parable that Jesus told about the prodigal son. And listen, when you get saved, when you begin to follow Jesus, the party begins. The party begins. And then finally, Revelation 7, 17, for the Lamb of God in the midst of the throne. Does this remind you of Psalm 23? Jesus is the Lamb. He will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Not only is that my prayer for you, that's Jesus' prayer for you. If you've not been saved, I hope you'll do it today. Heavenly Father, help us today to follow you as our shepherd. Help us to realize that you're with us no matter what. You're always gonna be with us. We thank you for that. For those that are not saved today, maybe you would say, you know what? I wanna dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm... I'm going to talk when we get into our new facility. I'm going to talk about something I've really never talked about before. We're going to do something that you really want to hear. But one of the messages I'm going to deal with later this year is what it's going to be like in heaven. It's not going to be sitting around on a harp or uh, on a cloud strumming a harp. It's not going to be doing nothing. That would be, that wouldn't be heaven to me. But thank God, the dwelling place, place of God where he is with us. That's what heaven is. And so today I I wonder, would you like Jesus as your savior? You could pray something like this. Dear God, I believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he died on the cross for me. And I'm asking you to save me right now. I'm asking you to be my Lord. I'm asking you to be my shepherd. If you'll ask God, he promises he'll save you. Online, hit the bottom at the the button at the bottom of the page to indicate that you receive Christ today. In the room, fill out the blue next step card in the back of the seat you're sitting in and let us know. Maybe you have a prayer request. Maybe you need to take a next step. We're going to be doing the next step class uh, coming up. You don't want to miss it. Uh, We're going to have baptism again in just a few weeks. If you'd like to do that, whatever your next step is, I hope you'll take that and uh, be a part of what God is doing here at Avalon Church. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.